Welcome to Artificially Intelligent Marketing, a weekly podcast where we stay on top of the latest trends, tips, and tools in the world of marketing AI, helping you get the best results from your marketing efforts. Now let's join our hosts, Paul Avery and Martin Broadhurst. Welcome to Artificially Intelligent Marketing, episode 12. Very exciting stuff. We're glad to have you here today. We're going to do our usuals. So There's going to be a bunch of schnort, schnort. <laughs> a bunch of snort. We're going to have a bunch of snort and then see where it goes from there. I'm looking forward to this one. How about it, Don? Um, now we've got a difficult decision. Do we leave this in or do we? I, I think the listeners appreciate this. Right. I'm just going to pretend as if we cut it, even though I know you're not going to let me cut it. Welcome, everyone. This week, we're going to have what we always have. Short snippets. They're going to be great. We're going to have a bunch of main stories as well, which is going to include some Info about Anthropic raising a bunch of cash to build some next-gen AI assistance. We're going to look at Microsoft's Copilot coming to Windows 11. Pretty exciting stuff. We're going to look at Google working with Europe on a stopgap AI pact. I swear, Martin, you've written these notes to make me trip up while I try and read them. Um, But I'm going to crack on regardless. Um, We're going to look at the Photoshop generative AI beta launch this week, which is easy for folks to access if they have a subscription to Photoshop um, and Adobe Creative Cloud. And we're going to look at how Google has added generative AI to ads and product photos. And then finally, we're going to look at tool of the week, which is going to be Zapier. Right. Just a few bits there to get through. Yes, but it'll all be worth it because there's loads of deep insights in there, Martin. So I think it's going to be a, a, a blooming good time. Let's, um, let's start with those short snippets first, shall we? Um, the first one is that news actually today, we're recording this on Friday, 26th of May, is that OpenAI could leave the EU if the new AI rules, which we've been talking about before on the podcast, um, are passed. Sam Altman, who is CEO of OpenAI, said either we'll be able to solve for these requirements or not. If we can comply, we will. And if we can't, well, we'll cease operating. We will try, but there are technical limits to what's possible. That could be quite interesting for users of tools that require OpenAI uh, as the um, element that underpins the tools, or if indeed you're using ChatGPT itself and you're based in the EU. Um, This could open up opportunities though if other if if certainly open ai and maybe other us based firms could open up opportunities for ai firms based in europe and that are us uh, sorry eu compliant to gain some market traction by dominating in the eu first so i doubt we get that far if i'm honest but it'd be interesting to see how this opens up Next short snippet is uh, A16Z released its AI Canon this week. You probably saw some posts. There's plenty of posts on social about this. It is a mega AI resource with loads of information about how AI works, the different types of models. There's market analyses in there. It is a real one-stop location for all things AI. So if until this point, you haven't really been following much of what's going on, but you're like, crumbs, I really need to do a deep dive. Go to that um, web page. It's got everything you need and we'll pop it in the show notes, won't we, Martin? Yeah, it's got some fantastic sections in it um, from a nice gentle introduction through to the kind of foundational learning, uh, even kind of going to the the real fundamentals. I'd recommend people check out the Word to Vec Explainer, which is the absolute basic building block of large language models. I think if you can get your head around that, then you, you're a long way to understanding how these things work. So yeah, great resource. Agreed. Spend Friday night reading all of that. Saturday night, impress your friends at the pub. I think they yeah. will be bowled over. You may if not have one friends thing I've after. Learned, <laughs> if there's one thing I've learned in recent weeks, people love hearing someone bore on about AI in a pub. <laughs> but no, but you, listen, vector databases, listen. <laughs> yeah. Vector embeddings. Yes. Look, the way that cat and dog are close to each other in a way that cat and house are not. <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure this was part of the original version of how to win friends and influence people. And if, of course it wasn't, but well, maybe we should update it. We could probably get AI to update it, but that's a different topic we're discussing in the pub. Apologies, listeners, for the digression. Back into the short snippets. Um, NVIDIA's stock price went boom shakalaka after great and unexpected earnings. Presumably, 
everyone and their nan are buying GPUs to run generative AI models on, and that's what's boosted that. Um, we've also previously reported on how many large players are investing in developing their own chips. So whether or not this progresses um, and NVIDIA's stock price continues to go shooting up because their revenues go shooting up or whether um, most of these companies end up developing their own chips, who knows? But for now, uh, if you own stock in NVIDIA, you're doing rather nicely. Um, we don't, we're not experts in the financial markets and we don't offer any investment advice. A uh, quick disclaimer there. Um, Next bit of news is free users of ChatGPT can now access the ability to browse the web or use the web browser plugin, I should say. So even if you're a free user, now it will actually access um, up-to-date content through that plugin. It's powered by and branded as Bing. So I guess that's part of the trade-off there in terms of uh, being able to get to access it. Uh, And then you were looking at a story about water. What's this water story, Martin? Tell us. Yeah, so it turns out there's quite a bit of uh, energy and water consumption involved in using these large language models. There was a piece of research published uh, this week. We'll link you to the paper. It says, ChatGPT may have used 255 million litres of water in a single month. Yeah, so it has uh, not only massive energy consumption, but the water used to cool the data centres is also uh, enormous. So in April... Uh, ChatGPT reportedly had 1.7 billion visitors who each made an average of six queries. So that's a total of uh, 10 billion, but just over 10 billion queries in, in April. And it's thought that it consumes 0.025 liters of water per query, which gives you that 255 million liters of water and for comparison the average american family uses 40,000 liters in a month so it's uh it's quite a lot i interestingly i was at a workshop where i was delivering a workshop on uh, using chat gpt this week and mentioned this uh this figure and in the room there was i would call it at best uh, a kind of disinterested shrug ambivalence absolute ambivalence yeah totally people just felt that uh, and people actually started getting into the a, a technical discussion about how water in uh, data centers is probably on a closed loop system so what's the problem and i, I backed out at that point i had no idea no. that's above my uh, pay grade or knowledge uh, i have to say one thing i do remember a while back is having a discussion with a with a potential client by Strata back in the day who had data servers and um, stuff all based in northern Iceland, where it's proper cold most of the time. Seemed like quite a a clever way to keep your massive server farms cold and pulling in cold air from outside, which is pretty cool. Um, Anyway, another digression. It's already been an episode of digressions. People just hitting stop, pause, unsubscribe. Don't do it. I promise there's fantastic insights even greater insights than what you've had already hopefully coming after this and actually we're going to get there now because we're going to launch into our first big story of the week which is anthropic raising 450 million dollars to build next gen ai assistance martin you spied this tell us tell us what you found and why it's interesting for marketers We've spoken about Claude in recent weeks, and this is a continuation of our interest in this story. So Anthropic are doing a really good job of um, raising their profile and, and fundraising. So $450 million raised in Series C funding. Uh, it's thought that it values Anthropic at over $4.1 billion, and there are some interesting venture groups backing them. So Google, Salesforce, and Zoom are all in on this round. So Anthropic is aiming to build next-gen AI systems focused principally on safety, reliability, and honesty, which is through their Claude-based system, which is a constitutional AI designed to be uh, helpful, not harmful, and honest. Uh, So another interesting point that came from this is that Zoom had also announced a partnership with Anthropic to build customer-facing AI products principally focused on reliability, productivity, and safety, uh, following a similar tie-up with with Google. All of this gives Anthropic a good position in the market in terms of being able to compete against the likes of OpenAI. They're clearly getting access to some big players. 
the models are going to be finding some interesting use cases uh, amongst tech stacks that we all know and use every day. Um, the real differentiator for Anthropic at the moment is, as we have mentioned previously, that 100,000 token context window. So your prompts can be properly long, like novel length long. Apparently, according to the story, Anthropic plans to build an even larger next-gen model, which they say requires 10 to the 25 flops um, of, of power. Uh, so that will require £1 billion funding in the next 18 months. You know, so that's not, that's not a cheap endeavour. Uh, apparently hoping to raise five billion over the next two years to expand its products. Um, so really, they're, they're properly going up against it. You know, Anthropic are, are getting deep pockets yeah. in order to be able to compete with with OpenAI, who you know, themselves had ten billion pound of investment from from Microsoft. Yeah, it's an interesting one because I think. It shows that as marketers, we're going to probably end up with tools, as we've talked about on the podcast before, Martin, that are driven by different different large language models, which is probably good given the it hasn't really happened for a while, but in the early days of ChatGPT, when it went down a few times and people were like, oh, I got a thing for myself, um, which was obviously uh, extremely uh, challenging for the couple of hours it was down for people who were heavy users. Um, but we've also touched on how different models appear to have different strengths so actually seeing that we're going to have this slightly more diverse ecosystem than perhaps we might, might have imagined when it was looking in the early days like it was already an open ai takes all game probably a good thing for us in terms of diversity of tools that can do different stuff for different application strengths and weaknesses most definitely and having a system that is fundamentally designed to be different from something like GPT-4, which is the uh, RLHF model, the reinforcement learning through human feedback model, you know, having that constitutional framework gives it a real differentiator. And it's nice to see these on the market because you can, you know, a lot of the models are RLHF. So yeah, it's a good look to Anthropic. I'm really enjoying using Claude at the moment. It's probably my, my go-to model, even though chat gpt at the moment is uh you know expanding with lots of the plugins um the, the real-time connected nature uh to the web is interesting of course you know being able to to browse the web with uh, gpt4 it is cool but it's incredibly slow i actually find that i can go online find an article copy and paste it stick it into claude and say give me the key facts uh, quicker and i don't have to worry about character length because as i've mentioned already you can stick a novel in there yeah oh my jealous green eyes are gleaming now uh, and in fact with the variety of easy image manipulation tools available now i could probably take a screen grab and mark that up pretty quickly and easily at this point but that, we'll get on to photoshop later um i did see a twitter i think it was on twitter it might have been linkedin um conversation about how the real power of generative ai might turn out to be content summarization not content generation which i think is really interesting we've talked previously about this concept that someone might write a long memo or email that, that, that then gets summarized down by an ai for someone to quickly absorb they maybe dictate or write a fairly long response that then gets summarized down and actually the real uh gatekeepers of what information makes it through and what doesn't might actually be the ai summarizing tools but i am jealous of you having access to claude for that summarization reason because it does look pretty powerful for that well on on that point about summarization if anybody hasn't read wired's article about how they plan to use generative ai i highly recommend they, they check it out they published it a few months ago i think we might have even mentioned it on a previous episode uh, but it mentions in there about they will not use generative AI or large language models to do any editing. And they say, because it's always a judgment call and, you know, what stays and what goes, what is important, what isn't, is going to be different for different people. So um, a robot is just a different agent in that aspect. So, so uh, yeah, it's always going to be left to a human to make those calls. Interesting. Yeah. 
I agree, and I think we, we I think we may have even talked previously about the dangers of letting a single AI agent make the call on what gets into the summary and what doesn't. And uh, we, I think we talked previously about you and I read a book, Martin, and we're going to take different things away from it, right? Because of our context, our experience, our background, our particular interests, why we read the book, what particular sections we focused on the most. And yes, but um, certainly it's good to have all those all those different tools. And um, I think it's going to be a watch this space as uh, Anthropic continues to um, expand and evolve its offering in this market. Mm. Right, next, let's talk about um, Microsoft's announcing Windows Copilot, an AI personal assistant for Windows 11. So another previous episode callback here, but Martin, we've talked previously about the Edge sidebar and making the transition from Chrome to Edge. And honestly, I wouldn't look back at this point. I'm really glad I did it. I'm absolutely in and out of that sidebar, having being available to push content into to quickly summarize or to more widely search is actually proving really useful but of course windows uh, and microsoft they want to take that a bit further so with windows copilot windows 11 will effectively have a centralized ai assistant that you can tap into at any point so it's the equivalent of the bing um, sidebar in edge but having that basically in every app that you're using across windows and actually basically having it as you're using windows um whichever platforms you're working in so that in itself is pretty interesting and powerful because we've talked about the where are the moats for different companies and which products should a market to buy and invest their time and money and training resource and energy in and that ultimately because so many users already use google apps or um, Microsoft Office, there's a there is an argument to say wait until the this power comes to those because your team is already using them, etc., etc., etc. This is an area where Microsoft even has one up on Google, right? Because so many people use Windows as their operating environment. Um, and yes, I appreciate Chromebooks and stuff running on Android and also mobile devices, but for most people in the work environment, still using laptops of some variety appreciate a lot of mac users out there as well um but yes having that power baked into not just microsoft office but windows itself is pretty interesting there's also the sort of co-announcement that goes along with this is extending chat plugins to work in windows so in essence you can start to imagine this plugin app ecosystem that we talked about previously for chat gpt opening up so that people can augment your chat experience within windows with a whole host of plugins so potentially it could become very powerful tool indeed and maybe even a another play by microsoft to see if they can control which tool do you turn to first right like if you just got your your copilot sidebar always open in windows well, then every search that you do of your own files, of the web, of your own data, maybe t a generative text creation, image creation might all start in there. And of course, if they control that, then they control the ecosystem, one assumes. So pretty interesting stuff here and um, be interesting to see what that looks like when it starts to roll out. I demoed this to the group that I was talking about yesterday, or I showed them the, the video trailer um, from the announcement. And this comes off the back of having done a previous session with the same group where we'd looked at the co-pilot demo as well. And one of the questions from people in the room was, which one do we go to for what? And do they talk to each other? Is this is Windows Copilot going to be the same as the Office Copilot? If I because the the, the demo talks about, you know, being able to interrogate your files you can drag and drop a pdf into it and then take content from that and put it into a different document format so i think making sure that they get this right and it isn't a, a jarring confusing experience where copilot for windows can do one thing and then office can do another thing it, i think they need to get almost like a microsoft copilot the end this is one assistant that works across the suite of tools because at the moment, it's it. The demo makes it look like well, we've got we've got GitHub Copilot and we've got 
Windows Copilot and we've got Office 365 Copilot and yeah, I agree. I just hope they make it a uniform experience. You've said previously that because a lot of these large language models have similar strengths and weaknesses, that this could end up being a battle of UX, right? And having a high quality user experience and solving for the problem you just mentioned is a big part of that. I very much hope it's a sidebar that takes up a little bit of screen real estate at all times, honestly, whereby it knows what window I have open. It knows context I'm in. Aware. Yeah, yeah, it's context aware. It knows that I'm in Word. And so there's certain things it's going to do in Word. And actually, if I'm not in Word and I'm like, oh, I need you to summarize this in a document, then it just does it, pushes it straight into a Word doc. And then it's context aware enough to say, hey, I wanna, do you, what else do you want to do with this? Now we're in Word together because I know as well as you know, Paul um, Crumbs. Could you imagine the conversations I'm going to have with AI? knowing some of my communication limitations um so yeah i I, i'm in agreement with you i think that that would that could be the um the thing that makes it a winner or a loser because if it's hard to use or confusing people are going to get annoyed aren't they they will a general observation about these ai assistants at the kind of system level um or both the os and i guess at the um kind of suite level so Office 365 Copilot as well. They, they talked about something in the uh, in the Office 365 Copilot demo where they said most users of PowerPoint are using 10% of the functionality that it actually has. Um, and using Copilot will enable people to unlock all of this additional functionality that is baked into the software. And I think that's probably the case with operating systems as well. You, get into a habit, you know how to do certain things. If you're not somebody who is confident in a PC, so you sit down, you turn it on, you do your work, and you you would never dare venture into the control panel even. Um, this is going to make your interactions with your computer much easier, one would hope. So I think that's quite, you know, that's going to be positive because we, we sit at these machines all the time and barely scratch the surface. We, we get into routines of doing what we, what we know and... Um, if we can start to get the full potential of the, the tools that we have at our disposal already out of it through these assistants, then yay. I completely agree. Imagine this, because we've talked about, um, when we talked about the code interpreter plugin for ChatGPT and its ability to analyze data, uncover trends, report on those trends, write abs paper abstracts and things like that. We talked about how it's critical that you have an informed human there to know what would be what is an interesting trend or, or isn't or to ask great questions of the data but what i would really love is what you described and then up to the next level again which is when i'm in excel that the copilot tool has enough insights into what i'm doing and how i work to actually be able to say hey do you know that thing you're doing you could i could build you a macro to do that you don't have to do it by brute force and just manually like what you are and then i go oh, that sounds amazing and we go yeah no worries i'll create the macro for you and you all you got to do is press that red button at the top or maybe not it'd be like oh i've started the macro um tell me what next csv you want to feed into it or whatever because that that would be the cool part because the extra part to that is you don't know what you don't know sometimes do you, in terms of you don't use that 90 percent sometimes because it's hard to technically do but sometimes because you don't even know it can do it yeah Absolutely, particularly with the Microsoft suite. Oof. It's actually why I use Google Workspace a lot of the time because I always think Google Workspace, all of their suite of tools, they, they're not as capable as as the Office suite, but they're more than capable enough for what I typically need. Mm. Agreed, right. We better move on to the next story before we run out of time, Martin. So let's go to um, Google to work with Europe on the Stopgap AI Pact. Thanks again for that. Tell us, Martin, um, what you saw here this week. So a bit of a follow-up to the story that we've been following over a number of weeks, which is the AI Act coming in from the EU. Uh, and following on from the Sam Altman comment in the short snippets, easy for me to say. Um, so this story, uh, basically what's happened is the EU Commission or the European Commission and Google have come together uh, and there will be some sort of stopgap 
AI pact, as you mentioned in the headline. But the story will involve all major companies working on AI, both in Europe and outside of Europe. That is the goal, at least, because the AI Act is due to come in uh, in two years' time from sign-off or implementation. So there's going to be this two-year period where AI companies are not going to have to do anything. And regulators are a bit like, oh, actually, the pace of change in this space is, is so rapid that two years with nothing is a bit is a bit scary. So the goal of this AI pact is to mitigate the gravest risks associated with this rapidly evolving technology until proper legislation is put in place. EU Commissioner Thierry Breton said, uh, Sundar Pichai and I have agreed that we cannot afford to wait until AI regulation actually becomes applicable and to work together with all AI developers to develop an AI pact on a voluntary basis ahead of the legal deadline. I've already, uh, I already have a common vision of what could be put in place in anticipation and which could allow us to give some elements of protection, which suggests that this pact will aim to establish some basic rules or guidelines around AI. However, this will be voluntary. So this will not be enforceable. And this is going to be pretty much a good faith deal uh, between the likes of uh, Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, and the EU. Um, but it should help establish, or I think the, the, the goal of this is maybe that it helps to establish a framework for responsible AI development in the future. Uh, in the coverage of this story, not much detail is given. When I say not much, no detail <laughs> is given about Zero. what is, absolutely no de <laughs> detail at all. And this is covered by Reuters and a bunch of other reputable sources. So we don't know what this pact involves, but Breton has mentioned the possibility of labeling AI systems which would probably be some sort of categorization based on levels of risk, transparency, and other attributes that we already know are important and are kind of covered in the AI Act. The AI Act is going to be a very risk-based, human-centric uh, piece of legislation and regulation. And so it would make sense that they're, they're having those conversations in anticipation of the, the legislation coming in down the line. I also read something this week, I can't remember the source for it, but it suggested that um, people wouldn't be surprised if the AI Act gets watered down slightly in terms of requirements for transparency, um, because explainability at the moment is still such a technically challenging problem. And I think this comes to the point that Sam Altman said in terms of leaving the EU, um, that if the requirements were such that they just couldn't meet them due to technical reasons, then they would they would leave. And I, as you said, it when you were reporting on that, Paul, you don't think it would come to that. I I'm not entirely sure um, it would either. I think they'll the regulators will will work pragmatically. Uh, they'll be more focused on, or in my opinion, the EU will be more focused on the rights of individuals rather than concerns related to i don't know copyright or something like that yeah it'd be interesting to see that play out and neither of us are lawyers or legal professionals lots of caveats in today's episode um but yeah it's um i think you're right and when you frame it like that and you look at how sam, sam altman phrased his comments it sounds like they put more than a reasonable amount of effort to try and meet whatever the stipulations were one would have to assume that any other producer of large language models might also struggle to meet those stipulations on transparency and explainability i think maybe the critical one for open ai is they didn't really tell us much about gpt force training data set and needing to be able to provide full access and insight into what that data set was might be one of the kickers for them at least yeah, and you would think that, that this could be overcome by having some sort of auditing mechanism which allows for you know, commercial sensitivities where they are scrutinizable by those that need to scrutinize, the public bodies, but 
not necessarily made publicly available for for all and sundry to to see and interrogate that doesn't seem like it's you know beyond you know beyond the capabilities of man to figure this out no and not our responsibility either thankfully martin but yeah i think it'd be interesting as for marketers to keep an eye on how all of this plays out because again as we are all starting to think about how we can leverage AI in different aspects of our business and our marketing processes to increase creativity, improve efficiency, yada, 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 then understanding what types of frameworks are going to limit what types of tools before you make investments in building this into your business. It's just good to know where it's going to go. Yeah, That's very the- much so, which I think, sorry, I cut you off there, but... Um, that, that leads us neatly into the next story and a model which is very, um, you know, rooted in transparency and responsible uh, usage and respect for its community. I think if you read the rules around this next story, you, you'll see that the Photoshop are doing a lot to, sorry, I've completely balls that up, not Photoshop, Adobe. I've um, done a lot to respect creators. So with that in mind, Paul, what were you going to say? Because I cut you off. That's a bit of a ramble. No. Welcome, listeners, to my mind. <laughs> and we promise, as much as we wish we hadn't done this to ourselves, we're not going to cut any of the mistakes because, as we've talked about, the human authenticity of this content is absolutely critical so that you know that we're not bots um and or, although would bots deliberately make those mistakes and then leave yeah. them in oh dear listener we'll leave you to chew on that but yeah let's make a segue and then and take this into our next story which is photoshop's generative ai beta which has been launched um we do have an uh, Adobe account here at Biostrata, so I was able to have a play with it. It was surprisingly easy to access, although you had to update Photoshop and then you had to opt into the beta and then you had to update the beta part of Photoshop and then you had to update Photoshop again. It wasn't an easy process to get hold of it, but we were able to uh, and we've had a play with it. Now, what is what is this? So Photoshop has introduced this new feature called Generative Fill. It basically allows users to access the Firefly tool that they've had in beta is like a separate standalone and some of the power of that directly in photoshop when they're working in their normal image workflow using generative fill people can use natural language to guide photoshop in creating aspects of an image so what can they create they can add m elements they can replace parts of an image they can expand past the edges of an image or you know basically at the top or just make an image bigger and it sort of auto fills in a very contextually aware way there's loads of good stuff that you can do um i've been playing with it this week i've had uh, a couple of my very good friends having a play with it as well Uh, emil lamprecht who we've had on the podcast before and also andrew andrew muward props to you guys for having a proper WhatsApp bash of us just sharing the different images and what worked well and what didn't. Um, and at first, I've got to admit, man, I wasn't super impressed because I tried some things and it just did a very poor job of it. So there's some skill to figuring out how to use the prompt. Like unlike, say, MidJourney or ChatGPT, if you're overly instructional, in my experience at least, it pushes the instruction into the output so I, I um, made a picture of a horse and then I said, add a tattoo of a lion. But then it put a person adding the tattoo onto the lion and I just wanted the tattoo. So when I said add it, it included a person, a tattoo artist, <laughs> not the tattoo. Anyway, did I don't... you manage to did you manage to fix that and maybe put just just put lion tattoo? And that's see? exactly what I did. And that's exactly what then worked. Pretty poorly, honestly, but that was one of my early attempts. What some of the things that we it's found? It's difficult to tattoo hair. I think, oh, do you think this was the AI think... problem? It's like this is an absurd request. Yeah. I refuse. It's a stupid idea. Yeah, it, I mean, it was a stupid idea, and it didn't work very well. Um, with more playing between uh, Emil, Andrew, and myself, we got it to do some pretty cool stuff. So uh, Andrew spent some time ext- extracting. Emil and I from other images with the context aware select tool, which is awesome. It's kind of like 
You know, we looked at that segmentation model from Meta that was really powerful for just you click on a thing and it knows in a smart way where the boundaries are. The sort of magnetic lasso is going to die a death because if you, you can just click on a person and it very intelligently selects them and then you can remove the background really quickly and then chuck other backgrounds in. So Andrew had poor Emil was being attacked by... Uh, the Loch Ness Monster, a bear. At one point, we were trying to see if we could get Ridley Scott's alien in there. Um, basically, both Emil and I and Andrew's Im images were under siege by all these different characters. And in many cases, we're actually able to get some really quite good effects. Obviously, didn't necessarily look real. Um, but the bear, for example, was completely in the context of the background, even though the area where the bear was inserted wasn't in the original image. Photoshop had to create the background and then put the bear in it. And it got it sort of on the ground, if you know what I mean, like stood yeah. in the right place. Like it was, it was pretty cool. Um, in fact, the context aware expansion, so taking like a four by three image and expanding it to 16.9, like you would do, say, for a blog post header, or maybe when you're fiddling with images for different formats on social or different ad formats, that was also surprisingly good. Emil ran an incredibly complex requirement where the centralized image to expand out was going to be really difficult and it did a really good job. So I I think if you're a, a marketer, you should know about this because it's going to bring the power to you that usually would have required some significant design expertise. I think if you're a designer, you could probably use this to speed up your workflow significantly and it's absolutely worth having a play with um this came hot on the heels of a research paper um about a tool called dragon 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 i think it's dragon um that came out of the max planck institute it's not publicly available yet it was a it was a paper you've probably seen it uh, on social media if you've clicked on anything ai related in the last few months because i've seen it in many different places and the demo video is pretty impressive it shows an image editor a bit like Photoshop, but where you can drag around and it and it will contextually aware edit the image. So an example was you could close and open the eyes of a cat and it looked at every stage basically real. You could open a lion's mouth and turn their head and it was contextually aware, aware enough to again make it look like that's how the original image had been captured. There was a resizing of a car where you could like change the size of the wheels or the trunk and actually the image would adjust like the wheel arches would move to accommodate the new larger wheels like pretty cool uh, you could adjust a person's clothing like the lengths of their sleeves or a skirt or trousers and things like that and it would again contextually aware um, and it was able to do that with really surprising fidelity and make it look real so loads of really interesting image adjustment news this week which of course is absolutely critical for marketers in a huge amount of areas in which they work yeah and it's amazing to see the development in this area i was showing off um the canva magic edit uh, magic eraser feature um which is basically in painting uh much like the the tools that you've been describing with photoshop although the photoshop ones obviously have a a wider suite attached to them but yeah it's, it's cool these are readily available to anybody to use and you really don't need to be um a, a particularly skilled designer artist illustrator to be able to get something that looks pretty decent um the democracy the, the democratization of design hey absolutely and i still think the demo videos always show you the very best possible examples um i had an image of that I used in one of our blogs last week of um, it was a little uh, bit of satire. It was robots sitting in the Houses of Parliament writing up the AI Act, but doing it with paper and pen, which I just felt was apt um, in terms of how how government institutions might use AI to increase efficiency in some areas and then still make everything work with um, pen and paper. Um, but I digress. And um, when I tried to swap that pen for a for a, like a feather quill it just looked like i'd use a like an image stamp like it was not contextually aware at all i tried to put a hat on one of the robots awful didn't work at all but if you watch the demo video 
it's contextually aware enough, at least in certain cases, to figure out what the light source is and show light bouncing and reflections in in rivers and stuff like that um, with a decent level of accuracy that, again, I think you can get, but you've really got to get the prompt right, make the selection be just in the right place, try different prompts, and I think some images are just going to work better than others. So, yeah, great power. I think there's cool stuff that we can do. Still frustrating enough at the moment to maybe drive you a bit mad if you've got a particular vision in your head of how it should look. You, I still think it's hard to get that. I that reminds me that I was playing with Firefly this week with the text to text to effect or the text effect um, tool, and I know that you'd said that was uh, somewhat frustrating when we had that conversation. It can't quite do certain. Uh, certain textures and this week i tried um that i tried to get a text effect with donna kebab and uh didn't didn't work very well <laughs> if anything the reason my critique of it was that it was putting in a chic kebab which you know that's so wrong it's a million miles away idiot ai <laughs> i mean if there's a ticket there's a support ticket there yeah get on there right um let's move on to our last main story of the week which is um on a similar vein actually google adds generative ai to ads and image assets um mine do you want to tell us about this one briefly yeah so uh, a very practical use case uh kind of obvious that google would launch this uh, it's going to help people create ads uh, in the adwords platform so they're bringing generative ai to the adwords platform to simply add uh Basically, you simply add your preferred landing page from your website, and then using the the text and the context from the landing page, uh, Google will then create your ads. So it will generate relevant keywords, headlines, descriptions, images, and basically pull in any other assets. And using their huge amounts of knowledge about what is effective in terms of headlines and, and copywriting and what have you, uh, they suggest that these will be uh, rather effective combinations of, of ad creatives. Um, obviously, you can review and edit these if you want it to, to say something different, if you're not happy with it. Um, but yeah, you can now get AI to, to put together your, your campaign. Now, of course, you've still got to have a landing page that you, you create. You've got to have a, a page that gives good context and has a compelling offer in order to get the conversions. But then once you transfer that over to, to AdWords, you'll be good to go. Yeah, interesting. I think we've talked a little bit about programmatic and um, advertising recently. We've talked a bit about AI-enabled um, ad management and sort of auto-creation of ad text and stuff like that. Um, keyword selection, automatic bidding and all of that stuff. So this obviously fits in line with that conversation and will certainly speed up workflows. When I saw this, I'm a member of a number of direct response marketing Facebook groups, which is kind of very different to the B2B world that I usually play in. It's very much consumer oriented, a lot of it's informational products, but I find it fascinating to see some of the conversations because it's a lot of it's proper old school um, emotion, emotive, emotion based, persuasive copywriting. The type of which has fallen out of a lot of marketing over the years, certainly in B2B or technical industries like the life sciences, where despite our best efforts, everything ends up very feature driven and, you know, first order benefits, if you're lucky, never second order benefits of what it feels like to finally get a nature paper or to be able to unlock a new research application that wasn't possible before. And when I read those, I really get a sense for the world-class copywriters in the world who understand human psychology, understand what motivates people, understand true persuasion, write copy and structure landing pages and add copy and stuff in with, with real skill. And I'm not saying that AI couldn't learn to do that if trained on enough examples, but my fear with this would be it's a great way to get ads up quickly is it a great way to get the best converting ads? Is it the best way to, yeah, to get the best results long term? I don't know, right? That 
I think that the world-class copywriters of the world would say no. And certainly a bunch of stuff that I've been able to get out of generative tools like ChatGPT is not bad. Um, and, he, and if you tell it to think in a certain way and use a particular marketing framework like Ada or what have you, it can do a decent job. But nothing compared to some of these really gifted um, um, direct response marketing copywriters. So, yeah, th I think that would be the one caveat I would put on it. Yeah, a reasonable concern. And, uh, well, I guess we'll have to, to wait and see uh, what ultimately Google... And, and Meta as well are also getting into the generative AI assistant for for ad creation. Um, I guess the good thing, or the, the the thing that they have versus a a copywriter, right, is a copywriter can write can a really good copywriter can can spend time crafting say one two three maybe a handful of of variants. These tools, if you kind of hand them over. Um, presumably we'll be able to multivariant test different combinations, different phrases at scale automatically and find combinations that quite frankly, the, the human just wouldn't have, you know, it would take them days, weeks, months to, to do. I'd agree. I think if you've got a large enough budget and a large enough audience in terms of search volume around those keywords. It's really funny because in the life sciences, a lot of the keywords that we deal with are quite low search volume and we have to apply very specific strategies and tactics around that, which this wouldn't work for, right? Um, potentially. I also think to your point, if you're able to produce those, um, there's nothing to stop an expert reviewing them and then choosing which they think is going to be the best based on their experience. So again, expert human in the loop augmented to do this at scale and speed is probably going to end up being the way forward at least to begin with um so in, from that perspective i think it makes a lot of sense and ultimately if this is all a, if, if the main play here outside of i think your very good point about being able to split test and find out what, what works the best um but if outside of that the main play is speed and efficiency well, what does that do it means that there's ever more campaigns being running loads more ads loads more spend all the things that google yeah. wants but as an advertiser is not necessarily what i want because now there's more competition and cl uh, click costs go up i'm under even more pressure now to get the best cost per click the best click through rates the best conversion rates and now we're back to having a really strong value proposition effective messaging that's laser targeted on the interests of your customers which is usually best done through primary research which of course ais can't do yet um and then probably that's where the benefit of world-class copywriting to really make sure that your <laughs> your landing pages landing and page, ads and yeah. things stand out so it mm. could end up being like quite a weird cycle in some ways yeah no 100 percent. right talking of weird cycles no there is no weird cycle to link on to um talking of um all good things, marketing, automation, and cool generative AI and other tools. We have been playing, haven't we, the Zapier, Martin? So that's going to be our tool of the week this week and some of the cool stuff we've been doing with it. I know we've had a, both some experiences this week. Why don't you tell us what you've been up to, Martin? I finally connected my OpenAI API a key with Zapier and start just playing around with a few multi-step zaps so if people aren't playing with zapier or ready to automate standard marketing tasks in their day-to-day -day lives then they absolutely should get on it but i um one the first thing i noticed when i looked at what you can do with the open ai actions and the triggers i noticed that it has access to the whisper api which is the speech to text transcription tool now that's something that I've not been able to play with. I'm, you know, I'm not a coder. I don't know how to actually build on on the API itself, and this gave me a, a no code solution for doing that. So what I did was I um, made a zap that starts off by monitoring a Google Drive folder. Every time a new uh, a new file goes into there, it will upload that file to the Whisper API. So I will save a voice note from my phone. Oh into my into my Google Drive folder 
it then puts that into Whisper and takes the transcript. I've then created a chat GPT prompt, which inserts the transcript into chat GPT, grabs the response from chat GPT, which is a blog post based around the audio recording that I transcribed. That then spits that out into a Google doc and saves it in a separate folder. Um, so by recording a very short voice note, uploading that to Google Drive, I get a blog post created. I did this in a live demo with a group this week, a two minute, um, five question interview with a cybersecurity uh, specialist. We went back and forth, I asked him some very simple questions. At the end of it, we had a very neat 500 word blog post created, which with very light touch editing and a little bit of expansion on some of the points, we could have easily got to 750, a thousand words long that covered some of the big issues in the industry. And all in all, I think we could have had a blog post created and written uh, with two minutes worth of recording, a minute's worth of uploading to Google Drive, and then maybe 20 minutes of relatively light editing. Yeah, that is, I, I love that use case, Martin. And it's, I think what I love about Zapier is providing us with the, with the tools to be able to come up with cool applications for ourselves without having to code, right? Because what you did there is absolute genius. And then Zapier makes that easy by connecting all the different tools together. And this week I was on a, a webinar um, called How Zapier's Go-To-Market Leaders Are Using AI. Um, and there was just a real bunch of interesting use cases in that webinar. Um, I recommend Googling it and find get me on them. Maybe we can even include the link in the show notes. I'm not sure. Um, and watching it because I think it will really open your mind to what's possible. Um, a huge amount of what they're doing is very Slack oriented. So they'll... Um, They'll have it so that, for example, for their sales team, they will be able to ask for information on a particular customer from a Slack bot that then through a mixture of tools in the back end and different data sources it's connect to understands natural language questions about the customer, surfaces information about their, say, their business, if it's B2B, also reports information back from the CRM on different parts of in this case, the software that they've used recently and all those types of things, and actually just gives them that little customer summary ready to go into the sales meeting. But it's all done sort of automatically, but through natural language bot interface. It's like almost like having a sales assistant that you're like, right, I've got to speak to Bob from Acmeco. Tell me about Bob. And then the chat bot just explains it all to you, which I just thought was really interesting. I saw the um, a similar one that someone had done using HubSpot and oh, really? HubSpot, yeah. So because you can connect HubSpot with Zapier, um, this was on LinkedIn, someone shared this and it was a sales outreach email and they said really neat because the amount of data that you can extract from HubSpot in Zapier, you know, all of the fields are basically available. So every time a new lead is generated, you can have that go into the contact, extract all of the relevant information. And they pulled through in this prompt, they had. I think it was about 20 fields. So, you know, they had the, the, the basics of first name, last name, email address, job title, et cetera. But because HubSpot has HubSpot Insights, which is um, automatically populated data about the company of someone who's been on your website and filled out a form, it was able to extract all of that information as well. So this was what the company is, what the um, kind of annual revenue is, the kind of estimated annual revenue number of employees, the city that it's based in, kind of one paragraph description of the industry that it's in, its website domain, all of that kind of stuff goes into the prompt. And then it said, uh, oh yeah, what page they submitted the form on. So it was contextually aware about what the, the context of their form submission was. So maybe it was a yeah. webinar or white paper or something. And then got it to wrote a sales email, pushed that through into um, a follow-up email push that into Gmail and send it. That's awesome. It was, I watched it and I thought that is super impressive. Like it, it's obvious when you see it, but it, it worked really neatly. That makes sense. I wonder if I'm not a big Zapier user yet, 
I've had a, an account for many years. Um, obviously, this has prompted me to play with it quite a bit more after we were talking about it through the WeMind. But can, can you link um, LinkedIn Sales Navigator? I'm sure, you can basically link everything to Zapier pretty much, can't you? Because then you could pull things on an individual into that, not just their company, right? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know why not. Um, it'll be worth having a having a quick Google. It looks like there is an integration. Oh no, LinkedIn Sales Navigator has not yet built an integration on Zapier. Boo! Right, we'd love that, please. That would be pretty awesome. Um, another thing that was in the webinar that was pretty cool was they'd noticed that GPT-based tools are really good at summarizing sales calls, but also classifying them. So what were the main features? Because obviously, Zapier's team sells software. What were the main features that the lead was interested in? What were the objections that they came up with? And then building a classification mechanism for um, for GPT to draw upon to then auto-classify those. Um, which again, if you're doing all of these things at the scale that some of these enterprise companies would be, um, there's probably loads of insights you could pull from having that quick summary of that type of information, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so I think if you're not using Zapier to explore some of this stuff yet, you really should be. Um, I certainly how I feel and Martin, your stories are even more inspiring. I guess in some cases, you're going to need to have API access to some of these tools to enable this, right? The um, the OpenAI example, the Chat GPT example you gave, that wasn't Chat GPT. That was a, that was access to GPT four API. One assumes to be able to do that. Yeah. So actually, I, I don't have GPT four API access. That just came from uh, going into platform.openai.com, um, making sure I could generate an API key, and I created a Chat GPT. API key, which is limited to chat GPT 3.5 or 3.5 turbo. Right. Ah, okay. But yeah, but you need API API access. Yeah. Yeah. The standard uh, account won't do it. You do need to create a developer account. Cool. The other thing that's worth looking at is API have now got this new interfaces tool, which is in beta, which promises to allow you to build forms, web pages, and basic apps. Um, no coding required, but where you can connect to GPT-based models like GPT 3.5. Um, so in, in essence, it's uh, it has an element of chatbot builder about it, but this is the underlying tool that they're using for a lot of the use cases we've been describing because that's how they end up basically then this lives in Slack but its ability to draw on all your other data sources through all your other Zapier connections uh, is where the power is. So a lot of the ones we talked about were actually internal Zapier tools, right, being used internally by their teams. But one assumes you could actually create customer portals or bots on your website that could perform similar actions, but low stroke, no code, because you're just doing it through Zapier instead of having to figure out yourself how to connect different tools and move data from one tool to the next tool and all that other stuff. So in some ways, having access to generative AI is like a massive accelerator for all those Zapier data connections that you set up over the years, but don't really bother to build many apps for anymore. If that's just me. <laughs> cool. Um, well, hopefully that was a useful episode for everyone. If you enjoyed, please subscribe, share it with your marketing friends. If there's things you'd love us to cover on the podcast that we don't, hit us up on the Twitters, connect with us and chat with us on LinkedIn. If there's things that we talk about that you're like, no, nah, I actually think that bit of the podcast boring. Well, we want to hear that as well, right? Because all feedback is very welcome. Um, if you want to come on as an interviewee because you've got interesting something interesting to say, maybe you've been piloting some cool uh, AI-driven applications of your own, maybe even in Zapier or other tools, we'd love to hear about those as well. So please do get in touch with us. Anything to share before we sign out, Martin? Uh, just the email address, actually. People can email us their correspondence, hello at artificiallyintelligentmarketing.com. And a human will respond. Maybe. <laughs> it might just have to be a Zapier into action um, and we'll set up a really complex bot to do that but cool thanks for sharing that Martin and thank you for sharing your time today lovely to hang out with you as always yes I'm looking forward to the next one 
Me too. Have a good weekend, buddy. Speak later. Bye. Thank you for listening to Artificially Intelligent Marketing. To stay on top of the latest trends, tips, and tools in the world of marketing AI, be sure to subscribe. We look forward to seeing you again next week.